against it. Oh, no, there's four. four. Yes. And he's seated. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we pass? Yeah, so maybe, maybe just... Any, uh, anyone? So we've got Dan, Dan, James, myself, and then Mark. Right, I'll sit. One more. And off. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you all enjoyed your coffee break and network, like Jeremy asked us to, and Maria. Um, so, using Jeremy Bell's words, apart from by what the minister said, and, and Jeremy is called for working more locally with communities, I feel that this, this whole kind of power to the people is going to be all about creating a new kind of revolution for Wales, I hope. So, I'll get straight on to the speakers. We've got four fantastic speakers uh, to kickstart the discussion. We've got Dan McCallum going first on Aldo Natale, who I'm sure many of you know, and his 10 or more years of experience of trying to get communities to bring turbines off, I think, is, is a story worth writing about, I'm sure, for generations to come. Um, James Feeney from Ofgem, who is head of distribution policy. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, interesting stuff happening around grid uh, issues at the moment at the community level. Mark Williams um, from Powers Wind Farm Supporters, who's been going since 2012. So great to have you here, uh, Mark. And Merlin Hyman, I'm sure many of you know from Region Southwest. And I know uh, Peter is someone who I work with very closely, so he's been working with and he's really uh, working the kind of work that they've been doing. I'm very keen to see a lot of that happening in Wales too. So if I can invite Dan to come on stage first and uh, yeah, share us the stage. Thank you, Dan. We've been at this a long, a long time. Uh, this is taking groups, old age groups, up to see the Tagalog Wind Farm back in in 2000. Um, I guess to sort of put some context to that, how massively the, the renewables industry, but also the community renewables, has expanded. Back then, our London Tower did a, a, a joint marketing thing actually with the British Wind Energy Association to produce this, this badge, um, I Love Wind Power. And you know, B BWA was about like two people and a dog in, in London, and Alan Tower was, was kind of me. Um, it just shows you how much the industry has come on. And okay, our wind scheme isn't built yet, um, but we are getting there. Um, but the massive changes that have happened in that period of time, as my daughter said, this badge is now vintage. <laughs> this is the uh, supporters that we took to our planning committee. And I think you know, this sort of thing is, is key. You know, although that, that project promptly went on to get turned down to that planning committee, it's not often you see that number of people vocally supporting a, a wind project. And I think that really sends out the message as a clear opportunity for community organisations and, and commercial developers to try and engage more um, and bring that level of not just letter writing but active support to, to projects. Um, the politics for us didn't, didn't work and it's been a really hard slog. But I think the political agenda has shifted. And so when I was at the Region Southwest conference um, a few weeks ago, it was interesting that there was a Conservative speaker there saying, you know, well, don't like onshore wind, but if it's a community one, or, you know, we, we would look at it differently. I think that whole agenda really has moved on, and we need to grasp that opportunity. This is a, a solar PV cooperative that I'm also a director of, uh, which is um, installed 119 kilowatts on, on five community buildings um, in South Wales. Um, and I think, again, this, this can feed into a sort of wider movement um, between commercial developers and, commercial, and, and community organisations. People really wanted to be involved in this. You know, we had a large membership, and it was, I think, it's one of the first ones in Wales to... Um, to do a share of it, it felt quite hard actually talking to community groups about, about investing. But I think now that it's built and it's generating, and all the sites are doing very, very well, and it's all on the internet as well, the actual production, um, it will be a lot easier next time and a lot easier for other groups. And it didn't involve the same planning nightmare for the wind farmers. And the whole thing took about less than two years from. This, I think, is this sort of the 
opportunity that we've got. Um, I'm also involved in the Only Overall programme, and there's about 48 projects now going forward in, in Wales, um, which are at various stages. Um, some are you know, getting built now, the Abergwyn, Abergwyn Dragon Hydro, um, others are sort of just about to get started, the Taff Bargoid Hydro. Um, our own wind scene is, is a part of that. We're at the cusp of actually producing a number of projects which will get a high degree of publicity and interest. Um, and I think I'm all, we're also working on schemes of joint, joint venture ones. Um, one, a 10 megawatt solar PV farm uh, near Port Talbot, um, which we think is, is, is going to be going ahead quite quickly over the summer. So there are real opportunities. It's come about as a, re as a result of the community energy strategy for England and feed in Paris. But there's lots of policy tweaks now which are encouraging community ownership, shared ownership of projects. These are the sort of different models that are available. So just to kind of highlight a few, shared revenue is one which that the Fin Tree Wind Farm has, has developed up in Scotland. And again, whenever you, you Google Fin Tree, lots of positive stories coming out of that project. Commercially it works, it works, it's built, and they're looking to replicate that model. A joint venture, um, again, only overall supported a project in Budlunov between the, in effect, the community council and uh, Techni, who are you know, a well-known Welsh wind farm developer. Unfortunately, it was turned down at planning by the chairman's casting vote, 5-4, but it got very, very close. And it, you know, it was so frustrating, actually, that the, that the planning in that case couldn't, didn't sufficiently take account of the ec ec economic and social benefits brought by the project, and literally total community support as well. That doesn't happen very often, and we need the planning system to take account of that. Split ownership. Um, is a new thing whereby the grid connection can be shared between a, a commercial developer and a um, and, and the community. And the, the, the project on, um, on on near Port Alba that we're working on is looking to try and sort that legally. And that hopefully is something that the question the one that, that, that James is going to look at as well. Because although the government has allowed um, the grid connection to be shared, um, hasn't made it clear to the DNOs that the ideal solution really in terms of funding would be uh, you know okay the, the commercial developers got that grid connection but actually then just to reissue two separate grid connections to the community side and the commercial side for that grid capacity without going to the back of the grid connection queue that's really important and it clearly is in the spirit of what the government intended the DNOs are very nervous about it in case they breach their license so they're looking to Ofgem for clarity on that. There's a fit digression at the end of June. That's one of the key points that we need to try and sort out to, to, to get, you know, it's not going to be loads, but a few projects built and funded at a reasonable cost. Because if, if the funders looking at the, you know, this, the banks, aren't sure who controls that grid connection, um, they'll just increase the cost on it, which ultimately will mean less community benefit. So it's key that Ofgem help resolve that issue and talk to you know, the, gov the government about the best way to do that and quickly. Crowdfunding, again, um, Abundant did a presentation here last year. It, it's not ownership, but it, and it could feed into many of those three models above. But I think the key thing with those three models above is that there's a, a recognized community legal entity, you know, a charity co-op or a kit, and that's the legal basis of the, of the community taking those projects I think, you know, from your point of view, as commercial developers, why, why, why would you do this? I think it's part of the trend. I mean, the UK has been quite slow to pick up on this, um, and that's probably why, I guess, our wind farm has struggled. But in Germany, 50% of renewable energy is owned by some form or other of community organisation. And everyone buys into the whole green agenda. It's not perceived as people just making money out of, you know, coming in and planting assets on someone's land. It's much more of a shared national policy, you know, the energy vendor. And I think we need to move towards that in the UK by every tweak that we can. Um, the split grid connection recently brought in by the government, again, it's another encouragement for community renewables. I think the other aspect as to why commercial developers might be interested is the funding side. The communities can still take advantage of the 
the EIS tax relief, which commercial developers can't. Um, and they can do share offers. You know, with, with they can be raised 171,000. You know, Bath and West Co-op have raised 10 million overall. So there is a lot of money that can be brought into the sector through engagement with community organisations. I think that is interesting to commercial developers. It means you're not looking to always secure funding from the banks or from your balance sheet. You can work with communities to bring that engagement. And we've, there's enough models out there that people will have confidence to invest. Um, there's longer pre-accreditation for community schemes. This is you know, called a deal in tariff. Planning. It's, it's, dif it's difficult. Um, there's been different decisions that have been given, some, some of which seem to recognize um, community involvement as a material consideration in planning. And I saw that the top S um, uh, wind farm did that. Still turned it, still turned it down, but <coughs> it's fair. Some other decisions have, have gone along those lines as well. I, I, although I understand that planning is a sort of land-based decision-making mechanism, I think it's, you, know, you can take account of social and economic gains, and those gains should be obvious from an involvement from a community organisation. And we need the planning system to take account of that, because from a community point of view, it is massively frustrating when you're stood there trying to you know, present your project, and you just feel you, you, know, you put all this volunteer, and other people put loads of volunteer time in, because it's the right thing to do, and yet the kind of system ignores it. And the other very frustrating thing is when planners say, oh, we can't take account of anything that you're doing as a community because that counts as a community benefit. And I think TAN 8, for all of its faults, does clearly distinguish that community benefit is the payment per megawatt that a development pays, you know, 5,000 pounds or whatever. That's separate, that's fine. But if you've got legally community ownership, that should change the perception of that project. I think one of the things that we want to try and see, or I would like to see anyway, just a sort of central register of Welsh Government recognised community projects. So local planners can see, right, this project, we don't need to look at what legal status they've got, we don't need to listen to some of the opposition who are saying they're not a community scheme. So similar to what the community benefit register, a list of community schemes that are being supported through the Only Abroad programme and perhaps are, you know, are members of um, Community Energy Wales. Um, and I think Welsh Government as well is you know, completely behind this agenda. They want to see a diverse energy mix and also a big lottery as well. So there's a, a number of different mechanisms which are there to support this. The only overall which has funding to support joint ventures and shared ownership. You know, the legal and the financial costs of setting those things up. Um, the Robert Owen Community Banking, Community Energy Fund, which as an, an additional source of finance there. Um, you know, risk finance. Um, and of course now Community Energy Wales, which is working very closely with um, sister organisations in Scotland and, and in England to, to represent the, you know, the community energy sector in terms of policy um, and arranging events, etc., to share learning between, amongst the sector. And that, you know, that, that is key because it's, it's a complex sector there's stuff that's changing all the time. There's now, for example, lots of interest in direct supply to communities, but you know, if you're trying to respond to that as an individual organisation, it's difficult. Um, so it's better if it's done through an overall organisation. And Renew Wales as well, which can help fund mentoring support between organisations. These are some of the links to the organisations that I mentioned. Um, so in conclusion, I think it's uh, a very exciting time for community renewables. I think there's a real opportunity. Um, in some ways, the Conservatives getting in, um, you know, I've always found actually um, that his result, Greg Barker, was really supportive of community renewables. And a lot of the policy stuff that was in the strategy came from him and obviously Ed Davey as well. And I think Amber Rudd is similar. And she, she spoke at the Oxford Conference on Community Renewables that I went to. That was her first public engagement. I think, I think this is here to stay, and I just hope that commercial developers start really talking to us in Wales about taking some, some joint projects forward so we can help hopefully avoid some of the planning nightmares that have accompanied lots of renewable projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
what the minister was saying as well, he seems to be very firmly behind the idea of looking at more local generation, the idea of having local connection to uh, where people can use it more locally. And I'm, I think some of it is de very much dependent on UK government. And I think this is where I think what James was basically saying to us about bridge connections and uh, connections for all communities is going to be very important. Because I think there's lots of experience currently in communities with groups about where the frustrations are. So it'd be great to hear from you, James. And hopefully you can leave us on a bit of a high as well. Good morning, everybody. I'm James Green. I'm Head of Distribution Policy at Ofgem, so amongst my responsibilities is overseeing um, our policies in relation to connections into dis distribution networks. Um, I was invited here today to talk to you about the progress of getting connected, um, but I also wanted to talk about some of the challenges which you're probably more than familiar with. Um, and what the DNOs go about the um, process of offering connections is, is, is set out in various bits of legislation, regulations, licensing, charging methodologies, um, which dictate how they are to operate and run their network. Um, in essence, though, they have to make the terms of connections to people who ask them. They can't discriminate between the different types of connecting customers on a first-come, first-served basis. Um, only charge you for the minimum amount of work that's required to get you uh, connected. And if you don't, if rather than charge um, the a fair price, then you can come to us and we can we can look uh, uh, at, at that and see whether or not we uh, we can charge you a refund. Um, it's also about that there's loads of networks, a lot of the DNOs that are, are natural monopolies, natural processes that need uh, need connections. Is open to competition. There are independent connection providers in the market. We want to encourage people to connect where there is a fair price for it, and, um, and in doing so, to try and keep bills for all customers uh, as low as possible. Forecasting where connections are going to be required is tricky, and it's particularly for um, generation connections. Um, economic conditions, new government policy, technology developments, all impact on what, where, when connections are going to be required. As a consequence, DNOs generally um, wait until someone asks them for a connection before they carry out the work that's required to get that person connected. Um, and that's partly to avoid the risk of building assets which end up then being used, but nevertheless continuing to draw on our energy bills for 45 years. Um, what this means, though, is that depending on where you're located, the cost and time to build the process of getting connected uh, will vary. If you're connected in a However, you're connected where there's limited capacity, where reinforcement is required in order to accommodate um, your, your requirements, then it can be expensive and it can take time. If they have to build new pylons, if substations have to be built, new transformers have to be built, 
very expensive. And, 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 and so you can't get a camera on the street anymore. It's not good. Um, now, these issues have always been with um, the, in recent years, uh, the changes in, in the energy landscape have sort of magnified the impact of these kind of constraints. Um, so, traditionally, the distribution networks were designed to take energy in one direction and come off the transmission system and take it into people's homes, batteries, shops. Um, but things have changed, as we're all aware that we're here today. Um, and we're increasingly seeing energy flowing in two directions in the network. Since 2010, which is when I joined that job, the um, EV drove <coughs> remarkably. And it continues to grow an astonishing rate. Over the last year, we had more solar installed in EV than any country in Europe. Um, we're talking about 50 billion pounds worth invested since 2010. And 700,000 solar installations in the UK. This had an impact on the distribution network. Part of their responsibility is to manage these impacts. So there has been increasing over the years um, a dramatically change of um, energy systems, dramatic changes in how people use and generate electricity. And that's going to continue in, in, into the future. We're going to see electricity, we're going to see batteries, we're going to see heat pumps. All of this means life gets more complicated for me and Alex. So we've been interested in, in EV for a number of years. Um, it is now. Um, it became apparent um, a few years ago that customers were struggling to, um, to engage with the DNA and to get the type of service which we expected them to receive. So I think EV customers had different requirements from the traditional solar centre of DNA that you're accustomed to dealing with, and the DNAs were, were, were struggling in responding to those requirements. I think we also had to recognise that EV Some got a particular location to use the energy scheme, so for instance, others were large commercial developers which could pick and choose the right location to increase the maximum of their, their returns. Some developers were you know, part of multinational groups that had access to international agreements, access to financing, others struggled to raise the, the, the funding to cover the uh, cost of getting connected to the network. Some were more restricted by local planning issues. Um, and although EG is expected to reduce flows across the, uh, the system as a whole, we increasingly start seeing clusters of EG in regions which is leading to reverse flows back onto the transmission system, which presents the whole industry with a wider range of, of, of challenges to try and ensure the system remains in balance. Um, all of which creates traffic and solar opportunities for the for, for, for network to accommodate. So we, we've taken various steps to ensure that EV doesn't encounter unnecessary barriers to it. It's not the same as saying that it encounter any barriers. So we try to work with the EV community and the DNA to at least improve the, uh, the uh, engagement that takes place between the two. We set up the DB Forum. Um, the first one was held back in 2011, and the idea was that we would get DNA and EG stakeholders together in a room to talk about the issues and to work out it's been um, carried on since 2011. Uh, it's not just an annual event. There's an ongoing DG DNA steering group, which meets uh, throughout the year. <coughs> and each of the DNA should be calling out their own engagement with local um, DG uh, stakeholders. <coughs> we want real commitment from the DNA to get on this flexi window dressing. There's a PR exercise. We want from the top of the organisation the chief executive to sign off on work plans that they deliver. It's worked sort of. It, I'm not going to say it solved all known ills, but it has led to some tangible improvements in the uptake of information and willingness to engage um, from the DNA. Now, in your own personal experience might be want to run counter to that, so it may not be just you know, a bit of data sheet from where they were five years ago. But you should be able to see more information online, um, which you know, should give you an indication before you actually apply for it.
guide you um, to, to, to give you a feel of what that transformation may, may be expected to be for the through that process. You should find the more willing to, to, to start saving payments and build up to um, making a connection that that helps in, 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 in terms of your wealth finance generation. And you should get more detail from the tax system they provide so that you're at least in a position if you do want to go to the, an alternative option provider to compare and contrast um, what you're paying for. It needs your input. So you, 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 we, we, we can put incentives on the DNA to, to undertake this type of innovation, but I need people. So what we've done, building on the DG forum, we, um, we set pricing targets on the DNA to determine how, how they recover their revenues. Um, and as part of this new pricing target, which started last month and runs for eight years, we've introduced an incentive form of incentive on predictions and data, which tended to you know, enshrine the principles of the DG forum in, 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 into, into the revenue into the price control arrangement. So if they don't go out to speak to stakeholders such as yourself, if they don't listen to what you tell them, if they don't produce plans which respond to what you told them, if they don't then deliver on those plans, then we've got the ability to levy penalties, financial penalties on them. So you tend to get them to, to take the risk to, to the issues that are being raised by the tax regulator and respond to them. There's not all that know that the, 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 the need to, to cut the extension is a significant issue that you might encounter. Um, it's a cost to you, it's next in customer, it's a cost to consumers generally. We know how concerned people are about energy bills and we have to be mindful that we don't um, take steps to improve the lot of one group of customers but in doing so we open the door for all. And, uh, and, uh, and I'd like to contend that you know, we have to be sort of bullish as to you know, the cost of the tool. But, you know, isn't that easy, but it's certainly not mine. Um, there are you know, new investment, investment in new in, uh, network infrastructure is expensive. And if there's an alternative, um, we really think the DNA has all the best tools for those alternatives. So it could be developing time enough to take care of that risk. So to, to, to demonstrate that you're doing it as a strong consortium in which when you design combine demand with generation. Um, so to try and you know, in, to encourage these, these more innovative approaches, we, we've set up innovation funds and, and, and we have taken the encounter to consumer managers to try things which are specifically intended to find creative ways of getting people connected in constrained parts of the network. And some of them are starting to, to start, starting to complete and we're finding that there's you know, some headlines there from the bottom that we're getting more, we're getting more people connected to parts tried, now it's got to be rolled out to business as usual. Um, but again, that's part of how the, uh, the price control should work in terms of that, that, that kind of behaviour. But we're also interested in what else is potentially in the process of getting connected. We recently um, consulted on um, how to make connections quicker and more efficient, and in this consultation we, we set out a number of propos proposals that have been made to us to enable the DNA to undertake more anticipated investments. So rather than wait for someone else for a connection, they should, you know, how, how, do, how do they get to a position where they have more certainty on what's going to be required in the future? And who should pay for that? Um, how do you reduce the need for the reporting? Because if you can find a way of um, to, to shorten your headroom on, net, on the network without being more really taxing, then, then that works for everyone. So uh, what can we do there? How do you manage the connection split? How, how do you sift out the, um, the projects which are never going to go ahead and which nevertheless are sitting on a patent book um, in order to enable the, uh, you know, the, 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 the more viable scheme to, to get to the front of the queue? And are there options to have more flexibility in how you get some charges built up front? Maybe align with the sudden revenues that are going to be generated once the queue is up and running. Um, all of these deliver benefits, all of these also have consequential impacts on, on us. We've had a really full response to this consultation, which is good. You know, it's not 
worked up, but it had been a sort of a mixture of both points of view that some 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 say banks is kind of shocking. So um, it's a really interesting time to be in the energy industry. We've got massive challenges. Um, and being on the market and having an engagement with people such as yourself and acting as the yeah, will encourage them and will we'll, 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 we'll engage with you directly. We don't want to let the non regulated sector down. We want to make sure that we bring as many sensible companies to, to, to do the right thing, to really have a problem with that journey. Um, just, just a short plug before I sign off. Um, we due to celebration last year in English and Dutch um, on. Engagement, the willingness and the passion to do so. I'm delighted that we have something like a wind powers wind farm supporters network, and even more delighted that we have Mark Williams, who's a founding member of this network, come in and tell us all about it. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, I must uh, start uh, by saying that this isn't my. Uh, I, I'm very much out of my comfort zone in speaking to you here this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm much usually uh, I'm usually wearing wellies and waterproofs and chasing sheep around the field. Um, <laughs> I, I would really like to have done a, a PowerPoint presentation like, like the other gentleman, but uh, I, I don't know how to do that, so you'll have to, you'll have to really will have to stick with me. Um, I, I take my hat off to, to Dan for, for the work that he's done. Um, we do have some community renewables in, um, in Paris, um, but there's an awful lot of negativity at the minute, and I think a lot of people have been, been put off uh, from, from taking those projects uh, forward. Um, Dan mentioned uh, the, the Robert Owen uh, Cooperative Group. Uh, Robert Owen uh, comes from Newtown. Uh, it would be great that we could maximize uh, the natural resources of, uh, of, of Mid Wales um, in, in, a, in a positive way. Um, I, ha I have prepared uh, a, a lengthy uh, presentation. Uh, I hope I'm not gonna try and read it. It's, it's, it's coming from me. It's gonna give you a little bit of background uh, to me. Uh, to why Paris Wind Farm supporters are set up and, and some of the work we do. I hope it doesn't sort of uh, cover too much, but uh, I, I welcome your questions uh, uh, later in the panel discussion. Uh, my name's Mark Williams. Uh, I come from Mid Wales, not that far from Welshpool. I'm sure some of you have spent a considerable amount of time in the Royal Oak uh, in, in, in the inquiry. Um, I'm a sheep and beef farmer <coughs> with a young family. Uh, I think the Welsh beef and lamb is the finest in the world. You may wonder why a sheep farmer is here today. I sow the seed. That seed is Paris Wind Farm Supporters, a social media group supporting wind energy in Mid Wales. I cannot take all the credit, as there are many working in many different ways, but it was me that drew the short straw to come here today to give a presentation on the background of what we've achieved. Not only is quality meat produced on the land that I farm, but also energy. My parents have hosted wind, wind turbines for 20 plus years. I have grown up with them, maybe taken them for granted. Never has there been an issue until 2010. The Midwell Connection project is unveiled and all hell lets loose. There are many valid reasons for so much concern. And as it does not affect me, and at that time, I take my MP's advice and just keep quiet. The campaign intensifies and turns into a no wind farm, no pylon campaign. Many claims about wind energy were being made. I even started to question the effectiveness of wind energy myself. I looked into these claims, researched, visited the Centre of Alternative Technology a wonderful resource in Mid Wales, um, providing independent advice uh, on, on all renewables and a, and a whole range of, of, of diverse uh, technologies. It became very clear that wind energy was being undermined very unfairly. Misinformation and scaremongering were common tactics. 
I even received an email stating that was I to have a wind turbine, it would be to the detriment of my livestock, which would waste away and eventually die. The reason be given was that the noise that wind turbines make stopped the livestock from seeking. <laughs> what could I do? Who was I to challenge the local politicians, media, population? Especially when some that had stood up had been intimidated for doing so. I took the easy option and did nothing. It was a very frustrating and annoying position to be in. The trigger that kick-started Powers Wind Farm supporters was the rise of single small-scale wind turbines. I was made aware of a farmer that was applying for permission to erect a 50 kilowatt turbine. The whole anti-pylon campaign turned their <coughs> attention to him and his family. Not only did they highlight his application on social media to raise objections, they posted all of their personal details from email addresses to mobile and landline phone numbers with encouragement to have fun. This for me was too much and a step too far. Still, what, what could I do? I made some calls. Um, I knew I was not the only person uh, feeling this way and others wanted to be involved. Nobody wanted to stick their head above the parapet. Um, and that was how the Paris Wind Farm supporters Facebook page uh, was, was, was set up. Um, uh, yeah, the, uh, we, we copied, we copied what the anti's, uh, the anti-windies were doing so very successfully. Um, we had very humble be beginnings and we were confident that if we got 70 likes, we could annoy them if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> the page was set up and with a few phone calls to raise awareness, off. 70 likes was achieved very quickly and we thought that 200 would be our saturation point. Today we have 1,080 page likes. Uh, to put that into context, conservation of upland powers at 507, stop the overhead pylons at uh, 506, with only Montgomeryshire against pylons in front with nearly 1,300 page likes. We are now also on Twitter. Um, at the outset, we did attract the attention from some people that did not agree with us. They were quite vociferous. To date, nobody has been blocked from commenting on the Powers Wind Farm supporters page, and only the very worst comments and language deleted. This includes accusations of child abuse. While this can be hurtful, it does nothing to debate of the actual issues. We have never risen to such comments and only replied courteously and with factual information. Very different to how people get treated on their opposition pages. I am blocked from commenting on all three of the pages I mentioned earlier, as are many others. I always knew there was support in Mid Wales, but was overwhelmed at the numbers. With newfound confidence, it was time to start challenging decision makers. It was actually a bit easier than I had at first thought. Uh, and, it, and it really shocks me at, at the level of knowledge of, of our local uh, community councillors and, and, and county councillors. Um, I started quite high up with a senior member of Powers County Council, a lengthy telephone call that involved a comment saying that it was not just the people who were affected negatively by pylons, but every person in the county, as it was going to raise everyone's electricity bills. He concluded that nuclear was the only way forward, uh, and it was the only way to produce clean, affordable energy. Uh, I invited him on a private visit uh, to a wind farm with some other supporters, and, and I was very appreciative that he he was very accepting and, and, and came on the visit. A lot of councillors don't want to be seen uh, near a wind turbine. They, they, it, it, there's an awful lot of fear, and, and I commend him for actually uh, coming out to, to visit us and, and, and meet us. Um, we met with some other supporters to educate him on all energy matters, not just the technical aspects or community benefits of, of, of wind farms. At the end of the visit, I asked him, did he feel misled? 
He did feel that that was too strong a word, but he had certainly been enlightened. <coughs> um, it does seem that after that visit, single turbines were having a much easier time uh, at the planning committee, uh, although it was not long before that councillor was demoted from his senior position. Uh, I rang the councillor that took over, uh, only to be told that he could not support wind energy as it only produces energy 17% of the time. And what good is that? I gave him an example of a Montgomeryshire wind farm producing energy 93% of the time, only to have a response, you would say that. <laughs> <coughs> I have invited him to visit and supply the figures to back up his claims. I am still waiting. Some other comments from councillors are, Wind energy is going to add 60% to my electricity bill. 30% of the energy produced in wind farms in Mid Wales will be lost in the transmission because it is so far. Um, solar is far more efficient, cheaper, and predictable. Hydro is 100% efficient. The one, the one I like the best, um, and this comes from a councillor that I spent about two hours on the telephone uh, to, um, but he told me that the concrete that was poured into the hill was poisoning uh, private water supplies. Uh, and he told me that because, and he knows that because he's read it on the internet. <laughs> he got very confused when I pointed out that many of our reservoirs were also made of concrete. <laughs> um, something that personally for me has, has uh, been a, a very big impact on what we do is, is the um, support that we've provided to applicants of, of single, small, small scale turbines and, and, and other renewables. Um, we've provided the support to applicants of single turbines that have had many objections, not just locally, but from around the world. We have encouraged letters of support, and even by having a chat over the phone to the applicant about the issues, pointing them in the right direction. Um, in many cases, they feel isolated and very alone. House Wind Farm Supporters has given them the confidence to stick with it and see the application through. Um, and, and for me, that's pr providing that support and, and uh, letting applicants know that they're not the only person uh, who wants this project to go ahead, um, it, it's, it, it's motivated me quite a lot that we, we've helped them and supported them to see their projects um, through. We uh, encouraged a local riding club um, to do a wind farm hill ride. Uh, it was a very successful day. Um, great fun was had by all, and not even the slightest flinch from any of the ponies. Um, that caused uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, interest points on our Facebook page. It was uh, uh, an awful lot of um, People were sort of against it, but there was an awful lot of positive stuff, and that story had a, had a very right, uh, a very large audience, and I think 20,000 people, uh, it had reached 20,000 people. Um, my MP and Assembly member, um, they have enjoyed the media attention these projects have caused. They became very involved early, and when the Midwells Connection project was announced, and turned their attention to doing all they could to stop wind energy in the area. At the outset, nobody challenged their comments. They both used social media very effectively. But did I really want to be Facebook friends with Glyn Davis and Rush George to ta challenge their view? <laughs> did I really want to comment in my name in a public forum? I did. Um, and boy, did I get a backlash. Uh, Every time I, a comment comes up about wind energy, I step in to support it. In the beginning, there were, there were many giving me abuse about my views, with Facebook debates <laughs> going on for several hours and some very long threads. All the time I have been courteous when others have not. I have added factual debates, and slowly people have dropped away, with only a couple of the most hardened anti sticking to it. Today, Others join in to add their support and quite frequently get more likes than the antis do. Um, Glyn and Russell allow free speech on their Facebook page and it would be you know, quite wise of you to follow their, their, their Facebook and their Twitter feed. Um, they, they, 
it's been a really good forum uh, that I haven't had my comments blocked on. Uh, and it's a really good forum for getting positive points across to a, to a, a pretty large audience. My outlook on the situation in Mid Wales today. There's a small group of supporters for wind energy. Uh, there is also a small group against. The majority of people in Mid Wales have moved on and are really not actually that bothered by these projects. NHS, low wages, cuts to services are people's main concerns. I actually think that wind energy and community benefits have the potential to tackle some of these issues. Mid Wales is a very weak grid infrastructure. Many applications for micro renewables are being turned down as there is no supply capacity in the existing grid we have. Both the Clawedog and Burnley Reservoir have massive potential for hydro generation. Currently, they have a combined installed capacity of 814 kilowatts. But many megawatts could be produced there, but there is currently no way to get the power out. It is only a matter of time before the current grid is at full capacity, not only for exporting renewable energy, but also to sustain further economical, economic development in the area. It is quite often talked about that some factories cannot come to the area because the, the existing grid cannot sustain their energy needs. The Mid Wales Connection project is in the first instance about the export of energy from wind farms today. But with our abundance of natural resources, it will future-proof our country's move to a low carbon energy production for many future generations. So what does the future hold for Paris? It was certainly good news announced last week the Garrick Floyd Wind Farm gained consent. I would like to thank Carl Sargent and the Welsh Government for giving such a clear commitment to low carbon energy generation in Mid Wales. Some more good news, that Siemens will have a Mid Wales operating base in my hometown of Llanidloes. Skilled jobs alongside those at RWE, Res and Lamy Solar in what is now a truly green business park. Jobs that support families, families that support schools, shops and leisure centres, many of which are under threat, under threat because of dwindling numbers using them. Wind energy and renewables provide a diverse income for farms and businesses, building resilience to the enterprise and lowering the cost of bought in energy, whilst mitigating our own CO2 impact uh, on emissions. Climate change is not going to go away. Fossil fuels will increase in cost, and energy consumption only ever seems to increase. Never has there been a greater need to support renewable energy. Um, and, and that's of all generation, not just, uh, not just wind energy. I think support needs to be uh, promoted to, to all uh, renewable energy uh, technologies. I challenge you all to go from here, from, from here today and write to your local MP, assembly member, etc. We've all got a role to play uh, in, in hammering home the message of, of promoting uh, renewable energy. If a sheep farmer can do it, I'm sure some of you can too. Um, I would like to see other support groups like Paris Wind Farm supporters pop up all over the country. We can network and build support. That's exactly what the Antis are doing. Um, I've seen uh, anti-wind campaigns from all over the country, and quite, uh, quite often uh, it's the same characters who are popping up in Scotland, England, and, and Wales, and the same ones pushing the, uh, the propaganda. I started by saying that Welsh beef and lamb are the finest in the world. I hope you all go out and buy plenty, because <laughs> lamb trade at the moment is, is not great. Um, I am also very proud about the energy we produce, and it is nothing to be ashamed of. Many people take food and energy for granted, until, of course, it is not there. Not only in my very small way do I help, uh, I help feed the world, uh, but I also help to power the nation. I think it's worth supporting. I hope you all do too. Diotima.
it's not just part of the people, but part of social media, but I think both, like you're saying, the anti-team and support, but also what pro and supporters can do. I think it's, it's, it's great. More power to you for doing so. Um, and, and good luck with the, uh, with, with the mission that you have. Now, our last speaker is Merlin. I'm sure many of you know Merlin from the Eden Southwest. Uh, Regan Southwest is a trade body for renewable energy in the Southwest of England. And Merlin is a, is a leading recognized figure in the development of renewable energy and role in economic and social development. And he's certainly been giving us some, some advice on local energy development and the potential for it. Um, uh, I think it was a report that came out a couple of years ago, which looked at what is the landscape for renewable energy and why. And also sits on the government shared on the task force, which was mentioned earlier this morning. So Marlon, over to you. Thank you very much, Rita. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thanks to Mark for what I thought was a very inspiring uh, presentation. And I think um, perhaps sets a scene and perhaps articulates much more clearly than I could do as to why this, the whole kind of community energy revolution and the shared ownership, which I've been asked to speak on specifically, is so important. Um, and I guess for, for me, in terms of my own journey, I joined Regen about five years ago with a kind of mission which is about changing the way we generate fire and use energy. Sounds a little bit like uh, James, what James had uh, said, Ofgen is recognizing that we are on the cusp of. And it pretty quickly came clear to me that the traditional kind of business model of developer coming in, putting in a project, uh, a little bit of consultation, a bit of perhaps a little bit of benefit to the local community, was not going to get us where we wanted to get to. That we needed a much better relationship, a different model. And I think the scale of change that we all aspire to, I imagine in this room, certainly at Regen, is not possible to achieve without support and consent of people. And I think that's a, a, a fundamental recognition that as an industry, the renewable sector needs to understand. And it is, therefore, the kind of, in that recognition, Regen has spent the last five years thinking about how can we support the development of a community energy sector and much better relationships between communities and development. That is now, I think, almost accepted, uh, but a year or two ago, and when we first talked about it, was generally seen as probably impractical. So it's important to understand, and as we move on to the kind of shared ownership idea, that this is what, what's driving a lot of this is a bottom-up <coughs> movement. It's a movement of local people, like Mark, like we've heard from, from Dan, getting together, saying, what can we do in our community? How can we generate our own energy to make ourselves more secure? Um, and to give you an example of some of the thought and logic behind that, I tend to use the example of, of the town of Corn, folks from the southwest, Wadebridge, 10,000 people, kind of near Padstow, near Brickstein, kind of territory. You've been down there. <coughs> and when they sat down and thought about some of these issues, they looked, uh, one of the things they said was, how much of the town are we spending on energy? And they compared that to how much they're earning in tourism, the income stream in, in that part of the corner. And they discovered they were spending twice as much on energy, so all, all that money went straight down to their community, as they were earning from tourism. And as a community, they started saying, hang on, that's, that, you know, that's something kind of going wrong there. Surely we can do that. A little bit, so we can do something about that. And that led to the setting up of the Wakefield Renewable Energy Network. And those groups have they've come together and now have significant, I think, political clout. Emma's here from Community Energy England, Community Energy Wales, so a significant voice. And it's that that then led to the community energy strategy. And with that strong voice, I think, comes a kind of uh, an opportunity, as I say, for our for the renewable industry to develop in a much more effective and successful way. And to go back to my own experience, in those last five years or so at Regen, I'm not sure that there is a single week, maybe over Christmas, where I haven't had some kind of press, you know, some sort of regional newspaper, BBC, local news, BBC radio phoning, Radio Devon or Somerset or, uh, or, or online or community meeting some way I have been responding to or engaging with a kind of anti-renewables, what the hell is all this, what, where did this solar park come from, what's the wind turbine, what's that? Um, 
so willing to work like Mark. I have my own local fan club of people who are not so happy with the stance and the, that I've taken on, on those issues. I think my favourite comment was uh, in the Western Morning News uh, kind of response was, uh, what planet is Merlin Hine actually on? <laughs> I've been wondering about that myself. Um, so, you know, those, those comments, but where, you know, the, where you have a local group which is able to put in a positive perspective, engage in that debate, then you get a much better quality of debate. And it's therefore that where we've seen community energy coming forward. People start to do things for themselves. We're seeing a kind of transformation in the local dialogue about, about these issues. And that, that's the pride that I think that, that, we have seen, that we really see here. Okay, so I'd ask to talk specifically about, about shared ownership. Uh, Dan's already covered uh, some, of, some of that. But let, let me just um, uh, kind of sort of go through, if you like, where, where that, where, where, how we got to where we are and what does it mean. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that the idea of, of shared ownership, a community right to invest in a renewable energy project, you know, that's quite a radical idea. Actually. You've got, we don't think about that for other forms of development. When Tesco build a new supermarket nearby, you don't get a right to buy one aisle. <laughs> well, it's not um, so or whatever. Or indeed, fracking. Um, so it's quite, quite a radical idea. And it's potentially definitely possible in some parts of the industry, I think, but most of it is that this is another pain. This is going to be hard, expensive, who are these communities anyway that are ready to invest and do they understand my business? My view is that would be a, 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 a historic mistake in this industry. I think this industry should take this, this idea, which perhaps has been brought forward um, by some as a way of rather confusing things, as a, as a historic opportunity. Because if we can build a model about earlier, where we have a partnership between the development community, developers, professional expertise, and local communities, then as an industry, that's a much, much stronger place to be. And politically, over the years to come, as an industry I want to be representing, this industry which I think will be have a uh, have a momentum and uh, general support, which will make it extremely difficult for ministers of whatever colour to turn off. So this is, I think, is a huge opportunity. I, I mean, it's also, I think, the case that government, we have a clear political sphere, the government has said, and it said very clearly, if you want to develop a significant renewable energy scheme in this country, then you're going to have to give the local community a right to engage in the debate. If you don't believe in that, you think that's a pain, fine, go somewhere else. Now, and I think that is the message, certainly from the last government, my own guess is that it won't, won't stay. So, both in a sort of pragmatic, you know, this is part of the rules of the game, but also from an optimistic, this is a way of building a really strong industry, then you know, I'm very evangelical about this. I think this is something the industry should embrace. Um, so, so then, you know, what actually, what is, where are we? Where's it, where does it, what does it mean? And how's it, how's it working? Well, the, the sort of bones of it is in re following on lobbying from the community energy sector, the community energy strategy sets out very clearly we expect all the all significant renewable energy projects to give local communities the right to invest. And to then implement that strategy, the government did two things. First of all, it passed legislation, so in the infrastructure bill, there was community electricity right, primarily legislative power for the sector of state to require you, the development community, to give people the right to invest in the project. They, uh, the government then said, but we don't want to implement that. We're, that's our stick, if you like. We've got the primary legislative power. We want you to do this in a voluntary way, and if you think that will work better. So they set up the Shared Ownership Task Force, which I sat on, um, and which came up with a protocol. Mm. That protocol uh, is a pretty broad document. Uh, it wasn't the simplest thing to agree. Uh, so I think Maria from our UK, who uh, chaired it, would, would testify to you. Um, it's pretty principle-based, and it sets up a number of models. But I think the core to it really is, the, is, is principles about genuine attempt to engage with people and work out how to do this better. And the idea very much is this we're still at a fairly early stage, we shouldn't close this down. We should give developers and communities the opportunity to, to, uh, to really have a go at kind of working out what this means in practice and what are the best models. Um, but if you take that as a, well, okay, we won't bother them, uh, you know, we'll, we'll wait until they make it, then we'll wait. Then you're going to get legislation, and that legislation, I think, is not going to be very welcome. And it's, you know, it's quite a difficult thing to define in legislation. It's going to end up being a pretty blunt instrument that we don't 
that work, doesn't work very well. So, again, a real opportunity to shape, to shape the way this works. We've heard already about, Dan, about the different models um, uh, that, that, that are out there for shared, shared ownership. I'm going to talk, I think, a little bit more about split ownership um, uh, uh, as the one that I see most kind of momentum on in, at the moment. Um, but I suppose it's part, worth saying as part of that and more generally that nobody says this is easy. Um, Regen is currently worth, I've probably had conversations with at least 25 different developers in the last few months about how to make this happen in practice. Um, and it is complicated. It is challenging. There are all sorts of, it's all, all sorts of issues which I'll touch on a little bit, uh, little bit more. But that's not a reason not to do it. That's a reason to get, in stu get stuck in, work out how to make those models work. Um, and then, as I say, at the end of that, we will be in a, in a much better position. So nothing about my kind of uh, evangelical uh, views about this takes away from the fact that, I don't, that it is hard and that I commend both the developers and the communities who are working away at these challenges. In, in some of you in this room and, and, and many in, in, in rooms with lawyers and Ofgem, et cetera, as we speak. Um, okay, so we, in terms of then the models uh, of doing this. Uh, the one that I'm, I thought I'd just say a little bit more about in the, the time I have is, is split ownership. Um, and for me, that's the model that seems to have the most momentum at the moment. Um, and I think there's a number of reasons behind that. The principal one is this split five plus five split connection idea, which I, I won't go into in more, too much detail because we could uh, take rather longer than, than Rita will uh, allow me, but it, that, that, uh, announce, that measure from the government to be able to split the feed-in tariff to a project into two feed-in tariff projects has enabled a number of 10 megawatt sites that didn't get through under the RO solar sites to come forward under the feed-in tariff uh, with one half commercially owned and one half community owned. So that, that opportunity has really kick-started the market. Um, so that's, and that is a split ownership opportunity. I think also some of the fundamentals of the idea of split ownership, you end up with two separate projects. It's kind of a bit easier for everyone with the finance. You know, you're not, it, the, the relationship is, there is an ongoing relationship, but it's a bit simpler. There are two separate projects. So the commercial project can, it can be nicely packaged up for the finances and that, you know, this is one. And then over here we have a separate one which is owned by the community. So in, in some ways I think it can be, it, it can be a clearer position. It's also, I think, something that the communities, the more, particularly as the community sector gets more developed, instinctively are actually, I find, more comfortable with. Most of them, I find now, want to, in the phrase, I think, of Stephen Frankel from Weybridge Renewable Energy Network the, the other day, I want to own something I can kick. This is perspective. You know, I, want, I want, you know, actual physical thing I, the, we, the community, own not a kind of financial instrument in something which I don't really understand and I'm a bit dubious about. You know, I want to own something I can, I can kick. So that's a kind of psychological reason why communities are perhaps particularly keen. And a lot of developers, I think, start by thinking, surely a community just won't want to get involved in all that complexity. You know, if I just say they're going to get X percent of the share of the revenue every year, then surely that's simpler and happier. And yes, I think in many cases, some communities it, it will be. But increasingly, I see communities want to, as I say, own something they they can kick. So the split ownership model is the one I think is probably getting most traction, certainly in the solar sector, perhaps, perhaps not quite the same in, in the wind sector. Um, as I say, not easy. You know, what, what does a split connection mean? You've got two sites now, one site, there's now two sites. What does Ofgem think it, it, with one connection? But what do you have to do? You have to have a separate lease with the landowner, you know, or is a sublease enough? Do you have one fence between them or two fences? How does that work? You know, fence is actually quite a big part of the solar park's cost, it turns out, but two fences are an extra pain. But maybe Ofgem will think that if you don't have two fences, it isn't really two sides. Um, and the, one of the sort of challenging facts with, with this is you've got quite a lot of projects coming forward at the moment. We've seen community share offers be successful, but potentially you've got quite a lot of community projects coming forward at one time, all seeking capital. Are they going to be able to raise that all through community share offers, or are they going to need bank debt from them? And then you go along to the banks, and they say, well, okay, so I can put some money into your community project, but your project only actually has value under the law because it's a community project. So it, can't, it can only claim the feed-in tariff because it's a community project. So if I step in, and if you go bust or wrong, and I step in as a bank and take over that project and then use that asset to get back my money, 
It's no longer a community project. And Ofgem might say it's no longer entitled to FIT and therefore it has no value. So you get in, so, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of stepping rights for finances is into community projects is one that's sort of out there at the moment and some banks are finding particularly challenging. So, um, the, 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 what we are, the, the shared ownership movement is now really, I think, in full swing. There are many projects out there trying to make this work at the moment. Split ownership seems to me the one that, where the most momentum is. But it isn't easy. Uh, we're working with a lot of developers and communities to try and help them through that process. Uh, if anyone here is struggling with it and wants to have a chat, I'm very happy to do so. Because I think because we do have an opportunity, and it's if we can make this work in the next six months and year or so, uh, then you know, we can really launch the, share, the shared ownership as a core model for the renewable energy sector. But if we fail to overcome some of those practical challenges in the months ahead, then I think a lot of people in finances and industry are going to kind of walk away and think that maybe this isn't for us. And I think, as I said at the beginning, that would be a historic mistake for our industry. So let's work through the pain, and we're here to help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I mean, we've covered quite a number of themes here, all four of which bring their own challenges and opportunities in terms of what um, Dan was covering with planning and politics going hand in hand, but then planning bill may offer us the Planning Act. Hopefully very soon we'll be offering us some opportunities there infrastructure, the investments uh, alongside it that James touched on, but also things like the incentive for connections engagement that you mentioned could be an opportunity there. Um, and the, the different models that you were mentioning, you know, making sure that we tackle it right and make sure it works, otherwise, like you're saying, it can be a historic mistake. But I think fundamentally also comes down to making sure that the challenges of having an informed debate where people are not just left in a scaremongering position of, you know, whatever comes to mind, they're left in terms of messaging, but where citizens feel empowered and with the right kind of information to really get behind this. And I think those are the sort of challenges in terms of if we're covering the theme of power to the people, what does it really mean? And I think some fantastic examples here. So it's very much open to you now in terms of uh, Q&A session to the panel. Um, but I think that there's this huge, I think it's, Encouraging with what the minister was saying in terms of the scope and potential for Wales, with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act kind of creates that framework within which we may be able to see a lot of this happening. But how it's delivered, how it's implemented, and I think much of it is about how much local engagement there is, I think rests with a lot of what planning and the environment bill policies uh, will bring to this debate. So over to you. Um, if you can let us know your, your name, your uh, organization, and then... Jenny and then I'm sorry. Jenny, yourself Hi. first. Hi, I'm Jenny Russell, I'm on the Planning and Management Society Council and I'm also on the um, Environment Committee as well, Mary Russell Bundy. Um, the Wales Move On um, is the, the consultation uh, that took place in the run-up to the Future Generations Act. Um, it's really clear that people want local sustainable economy. Um, it's very interesting to hear from James DNO are monopolies, and they're all foreign owned, as far as I'm aware. Um, and I wondered why, in all the discussions we've just had, in all the presentations, we aren't talking about liberating local uh, communities from the need to sell their energy back to the grid, rather than being able to sell it locally. Because um, we, we went to Germany. <coughs> recently and visited a community um, called Schonai mm -hmm. in Baden Württemberg. Two thousand five hundred people. They didn't like what their distributor was doing. They won a referendum to take back the license. They now have one hundred and fifty thousand customers for their renewable energy. <coughs> so th this is the sort of thing that could actually regenerate communities can be joined or mm. other communities across Wales if they have the power Selling it more locally. And then yeah. be able to sell it. Interesting, <coughs> yes. Why are we not thinking a bit more radically along these lines? Yes, Merlin and then, yeah, James. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you well, I imagine James' answer is that, that, that we are thinking 
more radically. Um, perhaps some of us in the room would like that to be faster, more radical. And Regen's just about to pay, publish a paper on local supply models. Because I totally agree with you. And it, it's interesting, when you talk to a community energy group, normally the first thing they think is, is how do I generate some energy? And the second thing they think is, well, why can't I sell it back to my community? It's a pretty obvious concept. And the answer then comes because you need a license and the, probably the paperwork to get that license would happily fill this room and, and the, the, cost, uh, the cost would um, uh, keep the average community energy group going for the next millennium. So, you know, it, at the moment, at that, there are legislative and regulatory barriers. There are some ways around that that we're starting to see with sort of white label uh, projects and, and the like, but it is, it is currently very uh, difficult. Um, I think the whole, that whole debate and uh, non-traditional business models, as uh, Ofgem snappily calls it, um, is uh, it, you know, it's starting to happen quite quickly. Um, we'd like it to happen quicker, and I think it, it is probably the moment that really unlocks radical, radical change mm -hmm. in the way that our energy system is structured when you can have a local, local supply. Um, and that, you know, there are some complexities about the way you do that and make sure you don't cause problems uh, further up the line and the system works as a, as a whole but uh, that I think is probably the most radical shift as you, as you say and the one that we should focus on uh, unlocking as quickly as we can. Uh, James and then I'll come back to Mark. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean learning, mer mer learning lessons are, are less or, or often suffer <laughs> than more traditional business models work which is so in addition to the consultations that I, I spoke about in my presentation of Gem was sort of concurrently issued a consultation on non-traditional business models, which was exploring some of those emerging um, opportunities that we're, we're seeing, as Mary has identified. That, that at the moment, it could be that the supply licensing arrangements are overly onerous that may present a barrier to those. So what we're trying to do is explore whether there are opportunities to streamline that process to better facilitate those, those kind of arrangements. It's not straightforward. You know, if, if you want to consume the energy you produce locally, you need to you know, possibly need more storage to be able to ensure that it's available at the time it's, it's used. And if it's going to be exported to the wider network, then you have to ensure that the wider network can accommodate um, that energy that's being exported. But um, it's going to be part of how the energy system works in the future. So you know, certainly that's recognised at Ofgem, and we're, we're, you know, we are working to understand what, what we need to do to unlock, um, uh, to, to, to make the changes within our existing framework to, to better enable these kind of these kind mm. of solutions. And if you had a foresight and division with an Ofgem, do you think this is something that we're likely to see um, in a generation? I work in the networks um, division. If you can find a way that you produce the energy locally and use it and consume it locally, you reduce the need for network more generally, mm. which reduces consumer bills more generally, as well as bringing all the economic and social benefits to, to the local areas um, that, that you know, those type of schemes promise. So um, it, it feels like it should be part of the, the, you know, it feels like the right answer. Um, and obviously, you know, we, we need to work out how, how we, how we, um, how we achieve that, that, that outcome. But, you know, it feels like it's, it's the type of thing we should be aiming at. Mm. Um, just just a couple of points. I'm not sort of up to speed on the technical detail be behind all of this, but um, certainly in Mid Wales, part of the problem has been uh, DNOs and National Grid coming in. And part of the what, what gets people's backs up is that at the end of the day, it's a shareholder-owned company, which is shareholders in foreign countries, um, and and people uh, you know pe people don't like that. Um, their misery is someone else's is profit. Um, the, just, just about local generation, um, in Mid Wales we have got an abundance of natural resources. We've got a weak grid um, and we're probably producing more energy than we could ever consume at, at the moment. Um, we have to have, in your constituency, you know, huge energy demand and we have to have a grid infrastructure to, 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 to move this energy uh, about. Um, if I produced lamb for as much people as, you know, that, that lived in the area, what, what would we do with the rest of it? Um, we export it, it brings money into the area, um, and, and we do have to be a little bit mindful um, of, of that as well. But uh, I mean, I'm all for communities getting involved and, and utilizing as, as much as possible.
as, as, as James said, um, you know, the licensing costs in the UK are, sort of, are, are very high. So, so communities basically can't, can't do it, they can't supply locally. But they are, they are doing it in Germany, as, as, as Jenny said. So we know it's theoretically possible. I think there's over a, a thousand energy supply companies mm. in Germany. When, when I've put this to, D, to some of the DNOs, they come back and say, but you know, they've got much higher energy costs in, in Germany than we have in the UK. And that's uh, Ofsgem's difficulty as well, is they have to look at keeping energy costs low. Anything which may increase energy costs is, 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 is difficult for them. That said, we know it's possible. Germany's doing it. The Conservatives like Germany, so politically it should work. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just sort of, it's, and again, even, though, even when I was doing, we were doing the consultation about our wind energy, that was one of the main things that even people op op opposed to the project said, look, if you can supply we with energy, then great. And I am aware of areas in Germany where they are got a range of different renewables locally owned, where they are supplying energy more cheaply uh, as a result of that. It's a difficult one, and you get into lots of complexities, but I, I just feel it's a key area for, for, some, for some pilot studies, some pilot mm -hmm. projects to look at local grids, how best to manage them, integration with a national grid. Um, and it would be great to see some of the European regeneration money within Wales being used to, to help fund those additional costs, because it's not gonna be enough to kind of expect the community just to, um, to sort of do this, it's going to have to be heavily subsidised to have to work out the best mm. model to 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 achieve it. What are the models? Because we're a lot. There's nothing like it, as far as I'm aware, in the in in the UK. I, I think I'd also I'd also flag. Sorry, there is a lot of work that, that's looking at the future of the smart grid, um, mm. and it's not just about you know what type of network you need to provide or what type of um, supply arrangements you need to provide. So we're look, also looking at how can consumers modify their consumption and yeah. use of energy in order to you know to achieve that local balance. It's um, you know it's fascinating, it, it, but it's really challenging. But there is a lot of effort that's being put in to try and understand how lot, how we can. I suppose the, the thing we're aiming for is how do you get an energy system which is affordable, which is sustainable, and which is secure. Mm. And 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 you know at all times you have to keep those those. Those, those three key issues in balance. It's, it's no. not easy, but it's... Um, not easy, no. But then that's politics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A question from Peter Austin. Um, we're all aware that... The Sorry, could you tell us more? Sorry, Tim Melbourne from the Right Centre. Oh. Um, we're aware that the grid capacity is a valuable resource. And we're aware policies have changed, but we're a little bit interested in early application and still holding on to those applications mm. and tying that grid. It's, um, I mean, I, I referenced it in, our, in, in my presentation, and it's also in our consultation. It's, I mean, if policies have changed, that's the DNO policy that's changed. The DNOs are under an obligation not to discriminate between classes of persons. Now, you know, as Ofgem, we can't, you know, we can't give them the assurance that if you do this, you won't be discriminated. They'll have to, you know, consult their own lawyers to make sure they're not sort of in breach of any legislation. And and the thing that's concerning to them is that if they start looking at the queue and picking winners and, and assessing the viability of certain projects, that they'll find themselves facing a barrage of lawsuits from sort of aggrieved parties who feel that they've been um, they've been um, hard done by. Um, that we're, said, we're talking about years. yeah, no, and, and, and I think what we're you know, you know what we're what we're concerned about though is that you know, yes, it's difficult but surely there's more that can be done. We know that we've got limited capacity in some parts of the network. We know that we've got you know, the DG connections, for instance, we know that less than one in 20 applications actually turns into serious connection contracts. Mm. So at any one moment in time, you know, and, and, and the DNO, when they've issued a quotation, they have to assume that connection's gonna go ahead because you know, they've given a price and, and if that person accepts it, they should only be paying mm. the price that they've accepted. But isn't we know that at any one moment in time... Isn't there a driver? Pessimistic. Isn't there something that can be done to rather than just do the sit-and-wait approach to actually kind of 
Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think a Western yeah. Power, who, who own um, large parts of the grid in, in, in Wales, they, they, you know, they've introduced more milestones into connection agreements so that if you know, here's your offer, you're expected to meet the following project milestones in the following timescales, and if you don't, we reserve the right to start withdrawing those offers. Obviously, with a degree of common sense, because no one's going to thank WP Leader will thank Ofgem for sanctioning the arrangement whereby you know, natural project slippage has led to someone losing their space on the network. But at least they're starting to think a bit more intelligently and think a bit more creatively about how this could, could be managed. Just Marlin <coughs> and then so uh, people may be aware that the uh, WPD in the southwest has put up the sign saying we're full, no more connections, thanks very much for six, three to six years. Slightly oversimplified, but basically... <laughs> There's, uh, there isn't a sign yet on the motorway in M5 yet saying, thank you, know, we're Mid full, Wales. goodbye. Sorry. And Midwells. <laughs> okay. okay. The, um, uh, so, uh, uh, and, but actually, when you break that down and you look at that, what's filling up the grid, something nearly two-thirds of that capacity filling up the grid is not actually being built or connected mm. yet. And a lot of it never will be built or connected. So how we manage that queue is critical whilst we try and grapple with the issue of how we do strategic reinforcement, which is going to take many, many years uh, at this point anyway. Um, I think uh, what we tried in the Southwest, we, we said, let's have a grid amnesty. Let's I went to all the big developers and said, would you give back any capacity you're not actually going to use, and we'll put your name up in lights and say, aren't you public services spirited, and, uh, you know, and then we'll have a big tranche of a gigawatt or so all coming back on, and we go on. And every single one of them said to me, that's a brilliant idea, Merlin, I've great. Now, my capacity that I've got, actually, I'll probably use that, so I don't, it doesn't apply to me, but everyone else, absolutely <laughs> great. So i kind of given up on that idea uh, as well. And I think it is, I'm afraid, I can't see much solution at the moment, down, but down to the DNOs getting a bit kind of braver about enforcing the conditions, which are in most of their offers. Now, there are old ones that, that don't, but most of their offers. So they're going to have to get pushier and harder. In a way, for example, if you get a contract for difference for a big project now and you don't meet your project milestones, mm -hmm. you can lose your contract for difference. So that, that kind of precedent is, is there. Um, whether there's any way of, of, of making it a little bit, of, of writing some incentive to people to give it back, because it probably wouldn't take much. I, I don't, I'm not sure. But there, if, if there is, then that might be a relatively small incentive might lead to quite a lot of this this uh, bed blocking, this <laughs> stranded at capacity, whatever you want to call it, kind of coming back in, into the system. I realize I stand in between this and lunch, so I'll take a couple more questions. The gentleman at the back. Yeah, I think when we're talking to developers recently, I think a, a kind of a, a concept at the heart of this of the shared ownership and community energy that people kind of miss is that you don't the money what you set when you set up a community energy group, it should be about local benefits. So the benefits, the surplus profits, the what you achieve should be about benefiting the local community. Exactly how you define that and what those benefit what those needs locally might be will vary. The investment doesn't necessarily have to be local. The investment can come in from from a kind of wide, a wide. It might be it might be an advantage, an encouragement to the more local people, however many there are, to invest. But you can bring in that investment much more widely. But the point about the investment comes in, and you sort of pay the investors the minimum you need to get their money in, and then you have a surplus profit. And rather than going up to a, a to an investor, that's what goes into the local community. So that the, the surplus is not locally. So if I take, I don't know, Plymouth Energy Cooperative, you know, they're into their second share offer. They're, 
investors are coming from all around all around the country, but every penny of profit that they make or surplus goes back into fuel poverty, etc. In, in mm. Plymouth, so it's that concept between you don't the local ownership, the sh shared ownership and local community doesn't have to mean that all the money comes locally. Mm. It's about the benefit flowing locally. Mark. Um, in Mid Wales, um, we had uh, a Scottish Power project. Uh, it was the Dovenant uh, uh, wind farm uh, on NRW land. Uh, Scottish Power withdrawn. I don't know what the what the reasons behind that are, but there was a, there was a perfect opportunity there for NRW Welsh government to have said, "This is publicly owned land. We we own it. Uh, we can we can plow." Uh, income streams back into the local economy. Um, you've got Pena uh, I don't know how income streams that are generated there have, are actually benefiting uh, the local communities. We have the community benefit, um, but I would have thought NRW is generating a cash income uh, by hosting that, that uh, renewable project. Uh, and yet, is it going to, uh, is it going back into the public purse to bolster public spending or should it be retained in that area surrounding the wind farm? I, I mean uh, NRW um, and Welsh Government probably perhaps should be making a clearer commitment uh, as to how, how they'd like to see those funds um, allocated. Jan and then Jeremy. I think um, th there's, a, there's a network of, you know, the, the only overall programme is there to kind of provide that sort of advice so there's, a, there's a mm. seven or eight development officers across Wales who are aware of local groups already that have an interest in, in community energy. So they can sort of point people, point developers to, or, NRD, or landowners to groups that will be interested. Um, there's obviously Community Energy Wales as well. Um, it's got a membership list, um, which, is, which is growing. And uh, there may well be groups within there that would look to um, take on new sites. Uh, one example that I'm working on at the moment um, is with is with uh, a, a, a co-op called Gower Power, who had you know they've got experience of energy because they tried to develop a solar PV site on Gower. It got turned down at, at, at planning, unfortunately, but they've got sort of fantastic experience. So when an, another potential site came up, we were able to kind of point you know put them in contact, and th they've got the kind of commercial experience and the experience of the planning system to really add value, working alongside the commercial developer. And they're going to set up a, a separate co-op for that site. But that's quite a common pattern that we're start starting to see um, across the UK, that you know, where, where there isn't an obvious uh, community group locally to set up a, a sort of new legal entity to actually act as the vehicle for, for that project and allow local people the opportunity to invest and to work locally then to ensure that the benefits are, are, are delivered back into the local area. So there's, there's ways of doing it, and I think the obvious people to talk to is only of all and Community Energy Wales in terms of who to, who to refer. But I think there may be something about making sure that that message goes out clearly to say where are those areas that people can go to, who are the people who can bring that kind of information and signposting to them. So I think there is something that probably we need to pick up with Community Energy Wales as well. Mm. I, I, I don't have anything more to add from, from these guys as well. I've already given Brilliant, thank you. Do we have any final questions? No? All I wanted to say right at the end, but probably picking up from what Mark was saying, is that are we going to be seeing a day when people will be protesting as much about opening and keeping open their libraries and hospitals as we would about assets like renewable energy in their community areas? I do hope we do, and we hope we can see many more like the Powers Wind Supporters Group across Wales and champions for the cause. And I think those are the ones we really need to bring out and try and highlight with the likes of Community Energy and Anivro and Renew Wales program who are really going out and engaging community and giving them that informed message. And I think it, it, what stands out very clearly from today's presentation is this idea that we need to make sure that people are getting the right message and able to have that open, honest debate on this before they can make any kind of decision. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference. And I think lunch is served downstairs. Brilliant. Thank you. Get off at some stage. I'm going to be here. Oh,
So, um, I don't know. Who, to who? Yes. Oh, yes, he has. Yes, yes. Um, gen only very, very general. Right, right. Well, we can, um, we've kind of been through. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm setting up a little bit of profits go back to Wales. To the postcode. We're looking for. Right, so you're you setting up the supplies. Supplies. Okay. Now, uh, it seems that it could be a win-win uh, win because the costs are yeah, two, two million. Yeah. Yeah. Set us up supplies of yeah. a billion. But there's no reason why we can't say, OK, we're going to have a wind project in wherever it is, in the country. OK, we, we will work as the energy provider for the production of the remote community can then buy the power Whatever price, um, I, uh, uh, local, I've been trying to uh, open the application. I know some of the guys I would have the 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 the